Welcome to this Nuclear Information Service webinar on the legacy of British nuclear weapons colonialism. My name is Trish Whittam and I am the coordinator at Nuclear Information Service. We're a small non-profit research organisation investigating and reporting on the UK's nuclear weapons programme and related issues. The topic we're discussing today is both complex and troubling but it is vital to the cause of nuclear disarmament and also to social justice. From its beginning in the early 20th century, the UK's nuclear weapons programme has exploited the resources, the lands and the labour of communities in the global south, the Pacific region and Nevada in the US. This included the UK's acquisition of essential uranium from the Congo, testing of nuclear bombs in Australia, Pacific Islands and Nevada, and yet, despite the far reaching impacts of the UK's acquisition, development and use of the bomb, this history is not widely known and it's often shrouded in official secrecy. The UK's global footprint, therefore, raises many questions requiring careful investigation. For example, what impact has British nuclear colonialism had on people living in affected communities? How did it affect disarmament initiatives in the UK and beyond? And if it's the case that the UK's ongoing possession of nuclear weapons perpetuates colonialist and regressive attitudes, how can that be challenged? Answering these questions and identifying what alternative policies should be pursued by the UK requires us to understand the perspectives and experiences of people in affected territories. A positive development came in January 2021 with the entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. This is often referred to by its acronym, the TPNW, um, and it now has 93 state signatories and counting. Several aspects of this treaty are relevant to our topic today. In particular, the recognition in the preamble of the disproportionate impact of nuclear testing on Indigenous peoples and clauses on the responsibilities of states that have used or tested nuclear weapons to help those communities affected and provide remediation for environmental damage. Last month, that responsibility was overwhelmingly affirmed by the UN General Assembly in its first resolution on the topic. And there is a very detailed report on the on the treaty, which was published by Rebecca Johnson. If you want to get all of the details, it can be downloaded from our website or ordered from CND. As an organisation, Nuclear Information Service is just at the beginning of conducting work in these areas. We have produced two relevant publications in recent years. One looks at the meaning and implications of the banned treaty for the UK, if it were to sign up and another collates the attitudes of non-nuclear weapon states to the so-called nuclear modernization programs being carried out currently by all nuclear weapon possessor states. You can find both of these reports on our website, nuclearinfo.org, and there will be links in the chat also. But as an organization, we want to continue learning how to include the struggles of people whose lives have been impacted by Britain's nuclear weapons into our research. We also wanted to reflect on the meaning of the Black Lives Matter movement in relation to the peace and disarmament field that we work in. So we felt that hosting this webinar would be a good next step, although we know, of course, there are many other voices that need to be heard. So we intend to continue to highlight communities affected by the UK's development of nuclear weapons, both past and present. Um, so I would now like to introduce the speakers for this discussion who will describe the impacts and the struggles for justice in three different regions, the Nevada test site in the US and the Pacific island of Kiritimati. Finally, we will briefly review how events and impacts in these regions are connected to the UK's nuclear weapons program. But we're just going to move on now to another area, to the, the Nevada desert um, and Ian Zabati. 
Uh, Ian is the principal man and secretary of state of the Western Shoshone Council for the Western Bands of the Shoshone Nation of Indians. He's from the Duckwater Shoshone community, which is 100 kilometers downwind from the Nevada National Security Site, formerly the Nevada Test Site. He is also the secretary of the Native Community Action Council, and he's going to tell us what's been happening there. Thank you, Ian. Hello. So uh, you've said it. This is a hard subject, and I want to tell you that I appreciate everyone that is uh, uh, tuned in to hear these words. The reason why it's difficult is because it undermines the certainty of the lifestyles we live, and uh, we need to uh, incorporate an understanding that doesn't uh, take us closer to barbarism. And that's kind of what's happening. We're losing humanity, we're becoming uncivilized, and we're descending into barbarism. So principal man, principal is competent, uh, responsible, and legitimate. And it is the uh, term for head men, our head women, our storytellers, our singers, the carriers bearers of of our custom and culture. And I want to start with a peremptory norm, which is uh, a principle of international law that is uh, accepted. Primarily the UN Convention on Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide enacted by the United States in 1988 under the Proxmire Act signed into law as by President Ronald Reagan and the 2009 Human Rights Enforcement Act. Now, genocide can happen slowly, it can happen fast. Uh, Jews were put in ghettos in uh, Germany for years. That's an example of how it can happen slowly. Uh, fast would be just the, the slaughter, such as death camps or Indian reservations in our history. Genocide also happens in waves. Before America was the old Spanish slave trail and indigenous people were slaughtered along these routes uh, in some communities, the uh, legs were cut from the men for not providing food to the Spanish soldiers. Uh, in the south and west from Las Vegas, where I'm at right now, along the old Spanish slave trail, uh, our people were murdered by Indian hunters. Uh, these Indian hunters, well, our, our people were first taken to build these uh, monuments to slavery, the missions in, in California. Uh, every brick and tile the uh, roof tiles were made on the thighs of the women, so they're smaller. The bricks were made by the men. Our blood, our sweat, our tears, our hair, our DNA is in every brick and tile of those missions in California. And people uh, are oblivious. They think it's uh, religious. No, it's a monument to slavery. The next wave was when uh, the after the Treaty of Guadalupe, Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed in 1848. California became a state enacted an act for the government and protection of the Indians. This paid Indian hunters $25 a scalp and $5 for women and children's hands. The uh, uh, Indian hunters made more money killing Indians than they did from mining. And the propaganda gave them much direction about how to treat Indians. 60% of my people were killed in the South, which is the yellow area at the bottom right. And um, that didn't get fully repealed until uh, 1967. This is the uh, 1863 treaty map that went back to Washington with the five Shoshone treaties. All property ownership in the United States can be traced back to uh, Indian treaties. And if you look down here in 1863, cross from the left to the right going up, it says up unexplored. The treaties emanate from international law and was created in, international law was created in relation with indigenous peoples. The treaties didn't give us anything. We owned everything. The United States did not have recognition by England until America signed treaties with indigenous peoples that also had treaties with England. The United States sought specific rights of way and mining by the treaty. We signed a series of treaties that allied ourselves with the United States to make America the nation that it is today. Indian land binds America together by constitutional law. Treaties are supreme, Article 6, Section 2. It is the law. 
The treaty is meant to preserve the existence of both parties signatory to the peace treaty. And we always had the best of everything, our horses, our homes, our food. We have five treaties with the United States listed on the right there. The United States tries to undermine the sovereign personality of indigenous peoples by making them a subject of domestic U.S. law and uses the treaty reference of a statutory law. We use the uh, 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 treaty reference of the Consolidated Treaty Series, Volume 127, 1863, which has our treaty on equal uh, par with every other treaty in the world. Here's the treaty. We seek to implement Article 6, which is the creation of a treaty reservation for the benefit of the Shoshone people. Other things we need to do is survey our boundaries. There's the boundaries. We don't have the capacity because the United States has kept us poor and then has uh, inflicted conditions upon my people uh, in secret that uh, uh, destroy our land and people and our ability to uh, 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 have an economy. Here are a couple of maps. I know I'm moving quickly and you won't get a lot of time. Uh, the center map would show rail and highway transportation routes to the proposed Yucca Mountain High Level Nuclear Waste Repository. We'll show more of that. Uh, it's important to point out that Shoshone were not U.S. citizens until 1924. Comanche are Shoshone, and uh, we speak the same language. In World War II, we fought an alliance with Americans uh, and, and other allies in the European theater against fascists there. Uh, in World War II, we also uh, fought uh, against fascism and our language helped save the world from fascism. Weapons of war in a civil society, society violate every Indian peace treaty. Uh, the Declaration of Independence talks of merciless, savage Indians. And uh, it's our opinion that the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, uh, the, the founding fathers' original intent, and that's what the uh, uh, constitutional uh, law Journal article on the right bears out uh, the intent of the founding fathers was to kill Indians. And I come to an understanding of this American right to bear arms from nuclear weapons. And on the left is Atomic Annie. That is at Fort Sill uh, on Comanche land. Uh, and that is the atomic cannon. How big does a gun have to be? So I submit that any of these weapons of war, guns, these assault rifles, these AKs and ARs in a civil society, when you pick up these weapons of war, you lose your humanity. You become uncivilized, and it's one step closer to barbarism. This is a uh, uh, map. Anybody at this point should take down the uh, Princeton.edu news website because this is uh, a recent map. It's, it was released about, uh, I think, uh, July 21st of 2023, 24 of the 92 tests were jointly with the United Kingdom. This is a radioactive fallout of those above ground tests from the Nevada test site. And just so you see, there is the Trinity site. Trinity uh, uh, is, is disturbing because I thought 40% of the plutonium did not fission. I understand that up to 80% of the plutonium did not fission. It is spread around uh, the continent, around the world. And the United States doesn't take an interest in investigating the health consequences, doesn't take an interest in preventing cancer by making people aware, doesn't take an interest in studying, understanding. In other parts of the world, Fukushima, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, uh, uh, Kazakhstan, and um, um, uh, Chernobyl, there are registries, there are monitoring and surveillance. We don't have that here because the United States doesn't care. We do this because we care, but we are woefully uh, uh, unequipped to uh, uh, do the things that we need to do. But we're doing everything we can, working on the uh, most complicated issues, and we've had success. We've stopped the weapons testing. We've stopped the proposed high-level nuclear waste repository, but we're being overrun. This is what they did to our beautiful country. The radiation is uh, above ground and below ground, but it went around the world. So this is a, a global matter. Here's uh, what we would call near fallout. Uh, we were and always had horses. 
when uh, uh, others came here. We had an indigenous horse that's thousands of years old, but when the Spaniards brought the, the big long-legged horses, uh, they were very um, uh, beautiful and we love our horses. But the United States Bureau of Land Management, the other BLM, blamed our horses, blamed our livestock for destruction of the range that was caused by the radioactive fallout from the United States and United Kingdom weapons testing. They then stole our horses. I personally was indicted by 16 people down here at the federal courthouse in Las Vegas. I was acquitted because we were doing the right thing for the right reason. But there are five to 6,000 people moving to Las Vegas every month. The politicians don't want to uh, support us because they can find 10,000 people. I'm related to 10,000 Shoshone in, in Nevada, but they can find 10,000 people, new people that don't know anything to like them and vote for them. So we don't get the kind of uh, attention or traction from politicians or even uh, 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 other people because there's so many new people that are masking the health effects and they are uh, taking the attention away from the important issues just for popular votes. This is uh, the Shoshone and Southern Paiute lands. Uh, we have a small overlap there, but we're all downwinders and the downwind area would be the uh, the north and the east, so top and to the right. And this is the direction the United States would wait until the winds were favorable to detonate those nuclear weapons. So we created a nuclear risk management for Native communities project with Clark University. The Native Community Action Council was created by the Western Shoshone National Council in 1994. We took researchers hunting, fishing, and gathering and began to investigate our own health consequences known to be plausible from exposure to ra radiation. And as I said, we don't have registry surveillance or monitoring, and we're experiencing cascading health effects that manifest in the children, grandchildren, and focus on uh, uh, girls two to one over boys. I mentioned our horses, the fallout. Again, under the... Uh, UN Convention on Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, uh, the infliction of conditions intended to bring about our destruction. So we've had the weapons testing. We've had the proposed high-level nuclear waste repository. We've had low-level radioactive waste dumps. We had the um, MX missile, missile experimental, the so-called Star Wars program of the United States, which is intended to uh, make a system of underground tunnels and rail beneath our country uh, to shuffle around America's missile silos, uh, missiles so they couldn't be found by the Russians, but making the whole of our land a target for Russian missiles. Again, infliction of conditions. Uh, on the bottom is the National Cancer, Cancer Institute uh, fallout map. It took 14 years for this uh, report to come out and it only investigated one type of radionuclide and there's been nothing else since. You can go to that website at the National Cancer Institute uh, and see where people live. And again, that's a, a just a small representation. And in that map, it looks clear by the ocean, clear in Southern California. That is not the case. The radiation is everywhere. Even here in Las Vegas, uh, the house next door to me is built before 1941. It has plutonium and is it is found it has been found that the older houses in Las Vegas have uranium and plutonium in the attics uh, and in, in the crawl spaces from nuclear weapons testing. On the right is, you know, we, we've had successes too. All of us have had success. We've had tens of thousands of people here actively protesting against the weapons testing and together with uh, Kazakhs uh, and others, we have uh, put pressure on the World Health Organization. We stopped the above ground testing. We stopped the below uh, full scale nuclear weapons testing. We put pressure on the World Health Organization and the United Nations General Assembly to seek an opinion from the International Court of Justice on the illegality of threat and use of nuclear weapons. And the court found in 1996 that it is illegal under international law. That then led us to the uh, uh, the law today, the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which went into force in September 21st of 2021. So that's a, a success for all of us. Those are the things that we've been working on that other Americans are, uh, uh, most other Americans are ignorant of, but we have good 
uh, friends and supporters here and abroad, and we're going to continue to press the United States and the other superpowers, uh, the nuclear uh, states, to enact the uh, Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Every step in the nuclear chain releases CO2. We have uh, uh, big men driving big gas-guzzling diesel trucks to the uranium mines, chewing up the land, breaking out. All fossil fuels contain uranium, coal, oil, gas, and fracking, uranium tailings. It increases the concentration of the uranium in those media, and they uh, uh, become what is called technologically enhanced, naturally occurring radioactive material. The fissioning of the core releases radioactive carbon-14. Carbon the creation of fuel releases krypton-85, cobalt-60, and other types of gases that uh, have half-lives that allow them to mix thoroughly with our environment, with our air. And this allows for uh, our, our, our um, um, violent weather that we're seeing around the world. We took our case to the Organization of American States, uh, the Hemispheric uh, uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. We took our ca case to the United Nations, that's the Western Shoshone National Council, United Nations Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. We, at the o OAS, uh, the United States did, uh, the OAS found that the United States did violate our basic human rights, rights to property, right to due process, and the United Nations served asked these questions of the United States, and since 2006, the United States has not responded. They have not responded, but we continue to go to the UN and seek uh, 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 a response for the United States. What the United States did do was in 2001, I believe, uh, uh, made this response where on the right, the answer they uh, rely upon the Supreme Court decision in Johnson v. McIntosh, which is uh, uh, calls upon the intercetra bulls of uh, of the Pope, the uh, 1452 papal bull applied to North Africa, the uh, 1493 papal bull referred to North America, where the first Christian nation discovering a land of heathens and infidels had uh, ultimate di dominion and absolute title, and this was relied upon by the United States as the justification for the uh, uh, um, uh, 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 dominance of indigenous peoples on this continent. And these get a little complicated. You know, another one is U.S. versus Cherokee Nation, where the lands at issue were not in the United States. And so the court creates these legal fictions that Indian title isn't valid in the United States. Neither would British title be valid in the United States if the land was in England. That's the kinds of, of legal fiction the United States creates. This is America's proposal to dispose of uh, commercial high-level nuclear waste from 115 U.S. reactors, uh, some with multiple reactors at 75 locations in 30 U.S. states. All of those uh, communities have benefited from the jobs, the technology, the electricity, the uh, 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 all of the benefits, the taxes. And we are to bear the burden of risk from all of those waste streams as they become a river to enter our country. And we've been able so far to stop that, but that is still ongoing. In the center of this uh, photo is Yucca Mountain. The mountain is 90% or 10% saturated with water in the pores of the rock. Even though it looks dry, there's water everywhere out here. Water is really what's important to the Shoshone people. We know what we're trying to protect, pure water. We have the oldest life on the planet in the Great Basin. We have all throughout our desert, the 11,700 year old uh, Yatumbi, we call it, uh, it's, it's called um, uh, creosote. And there's millions, tens of millions of plants, all from one king clone in the Mojave Desert in Shoshone country. We have the single oldest tree in the world, the bristlecone pine. 6,800 year old tree. We also have the Pando or quaking aspen. This is a diploid plant all connected underground. It has a white stalk, yellow or green leaves depending on the time of year. It is 25 square miles and over 80,000 years old. We don't know how old. 
we know what we're trying to protect. We have as much biodiversity as the as the uh, rainforest. We have bears, they have monkeys, but we have uh, lions and butterflies and frogs, you know, all of the uh, 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 diversity uh, that life has made, we have it here in the Great Basin. And we wanna uh, keep that, we're trying to protect that. Again, here is Yucca Mountain, the proposed high level nuclear waste repository in the far back there with snow. And you can see just in the foreground, three cinder cone volcanoes. There are 26 fault lines in Yucca Mountain. The United States thinks this is a good place to put high level nuclear waste. They're able to do it, as you've heard earlier, because uh, they can't get away with it anywhere else. They come into our country in secret, they detonate these nuclear weapons, and it is that culture of secrecy that we're up against right now. The people that are working there, they can't even prove that they work there. So in 1988, genocide became a crime in the United States. In 1990, the US Department of uh, Energy, the successor to the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, uh, sought to um, create this study protocol for developing Shoshone land to ethnically cleanse the uh, proposed Yucca Mountain Repository area of my people's living life ways. And the Department of Energy created this study protocol of cultural triage. It's a forced choice situation in which an ethnic group is faced with, I can't read the whole thing. Oh, faced with the decision to rank in importance equally valued cultural resources affected by a proposed development project. The features are it's force, it's race-based, and it's for development. We don't have a uh, uh, flood, famine, or natural disaster. Cultural triage. Triage is defined as the sorting uh, according to quality. Normal usage, flood, famine, and natural disaster. We don't have that. We have a del deliberate act of the United States to dismantle my people's living life way in relation to our land. In order to prove genocide, one must prove intent. It is the culture of secrecy that is the intent because you will not know what's killing you when it's done in secret. When they do it in secret, you know their intent. And that's what we're facing right now, trying to find other Americans who uh, 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 stand up with some dignity and respect and enforce equal protection of the law. So in the proposed Yucca Mountain High Level Nuclear Waste Repository Program, we brought contentions in the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission Atomic Safety Licensing Board. Ownership. The Department of Energy is required to prove ownership. The Department of Energy cannot do it. They couldn't prove ownership of water. Disproportionate burden of risk. Throughout the process of where the United States spent $15 billion before we got to the licensing, they could not prove ownership after spending $15 billion U.S. dollars. That's $1 million times 15,000, and they could not prove ownership because they came in secret and never thought they didn't own the land. We found that origin is important in our in our uh, um, health studies, diet, mobility, and shelter. What we ate, how much we ate, we ate the rabbits, we ate the whole animal, including the thyroid. And during these uh, period of weapons testing, every three weeks, the United States was detonating a bomb and the fallout was going around the world. And we didn't know about it. And most people didn't know about it, but we had nothing else to eat. We ate the whole animal and every three weeks, we had increasing uh, ongoing doses. Radiation exposure is cumulative. Things that we have to be aware of, all of us. Uh, mobility, where we went, what we did there. Shelter, where our houses were and what they're built out of. We had increased burden of risk that the Department of Energy, the United States does not investigate and does not care about, but we do. And we're continuing to do this work as well as we can. So that's the end and I, Sorry I talked so fast, but uh, I hope you were uh, connected to all the points. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. That was, um, yeah, amazing history and the depths and breadth and horror of the injustices. It's just, yeah, it's, it's something to take in. So I'm glad we're doing this today. And, um, shining some light on these areas. Um, people may like to put questions. You should have a Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen. You can start posting questions for any of the speakers, but now we're going to move on to 
Dr. Becky Alexis Martin. Hello, um, it's a privilege to be in the company of such amazing and profound speakers today. Um, so I, firstly, I wanted to thank them for their vital um, and incredibly important contributions. Um, so I'm going to be talking today um, about my um, research. Um, the work that I undertake um, explores atomic epistemic justice in Carissimas. Um, so I've been researching um, Carissimas um, since 2017 and working with the communities to identify um, these um, social, environmental and human impacts and harms from nuclear weapons um, and also thinking forward to um, how we can create um, adaptive, inclusive um, and um, sustainable um, development in light of future climate change. So for those who do not know Carissimas, um, is my slide going to go forward? Um, it is placed at the centre of the Pacific. And while it has a small landmass, it has an enormous oceanic boundary. Um, as you can see, it stretches right across the Pacific Ocean. Um, and the place where I research is called Carissimas. It's spelt with a T-I, but the T-I is pronounced um, in the um, Kiribati language. And it's the largest coral atoll on Earth. It is startlingly beautiful. Um, when you visit um, the landscape, it's etched with hundreds of aquamarine pools, um, girdled by a network of sandy paths um, and these lagoons, um, within these lagoons um, live all sorts of interesting species of fish. Um, and it's surrounded by coral reefs. It is truly one of the most startling landscapes I have ever visited um, as an academic, human geographer and human. And um, to visit Carissimas and to meet its community, um, initially you wouldn't realise um, the nuclear harms that have been undertaken um, on this land. Um, it's very hard to imagine colossal nuclear weapons being detonated on what is essentially um, a stunning tropical island. But nonetheless, um, between 1957 and 1962, um, the UK undertook 30 airburst nuclear weapons tests, um, thermonuclear weapons, I should add, which are the largest um, and most lethal type of bomb, um, and a further three nuclear weapon tests on the um, neighbouring um, islands um, across the archipelago. And this is, of course, while the territories were under British control. Um, so it's um, it's quite startling, really, um, that this um, was permitted to happen. Um, the local community had very little say and they weren't able to contest or change um, what was arising on their land. Um, and um, while the nuclear weapon tests cemented the British-American special relationship, um, arguably they destroyed um, the environment, the culture, and the livelihoods of the communities who had lived on the islands, um, not least because they were forcibly relocated internally across their islands. So the place where they decide where they previously lived, um, they were uprooted um, and moved from the location that is now Eon Field um, to the other side of the island so that nuclear weapon tests could be undertaken on what was literally their home. Um, so my previous collaborative research, I've undertaken quite a lot of work in this area as an academic and as an activist, um, has demonstrated the historical harms um, of militarisation and nuclear weapon tests. And it's shown that there are long term cultural, humanitarian and environmental impacts to the people of Carissimas, the people of Fiji, the people of New Zealand and the communities from the UK who tested these nuclear weapons. Um, but today, I think it's most important to discuss the impacts to the Carissimas people um, who are vibrant. They have an incredible culture, an incredible community and deserve so much better than what they are currently um, receiving, um, both from our British government, but also from the international community. So one of the big issues is that of what I call epistemic justice. So this idea of justice of knowledge, of inclusion in policy, of actually hearing and prioritizing the voices of the Carissimas people. Um, we already know that environmental and humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons testing in Carissimas have been substantial. 
we also know that they have not adequately addressed the needs and rights of nuclear weapons test survivors. And there is a disparity. If we look at British policy, just to begin with, and um, we know that, for example, last year, um, there was a mandate to provide um, medals to the Carissimas um, nuclear test veterans. So the men who went and tested the hydrogen bombs, a third of them was um, conscripted. Most of them were boy soldiers. All of them have had very little education, um, but who went and tested the weapons and returned. However, um, while there is some vague waffle um, in the policy statement that goes alongside this medal, there is no offer of direct support to gain an equivalent medal or any kind of reparations from the British government. And in fact, um, just last week, the UK, Russia and North Korea, we are clearly in very good company, um, voted against providing reparations and support to the Karasimas community. With the argument um, that if they obviously provide support to Carissimas, who knows who else we might need to provide support to. So there is this, um, this big issue um, really arising. Um, and the only way forward from my perspective um, as an academic expert in the field is to ensure that affected communities are engaged with and that they are put first and foremost in policy to policy development, that they are able to show what they want, say what they want and prioritise their needs for the future. Um, so a lot of my work has been co-producing research with affected communities um, and documenting the struggles that they have faced, recording the stories of violence and fear during that moment of the nuclear weapons blast, um, sharing in academic papers and our, our news um, about how babies are born, um, you know, with birth defects, how women lost their hearing and sight during the nuclear weapon tests. Now, while I have documented photographically and written about these effects, they are still contested by the British government. So the British government does not accept a narrative of harm um, and argues that their nuclear weapons tests were undertaken under rigorous health and safety conditions, despite the fact that their own archival documentation demonstrates otherwise. So yeah. I think it's really important, this idea of making sure that communities are heard. Um, Teoa Takaro, who I wish could be here to speak to you today, is the leader of the Carissimas um, Nuclear Victims, Cancer Nuclear Victims Association. And she says she's waited so long for support. She feels as though nobody hears her voices um, as we try to tell the world what we have survived and how, how their lives and families will never be the same because of nuclear weapons. So, the work that I'm undertaking at the moment um, is helping to support the community to identify their specific needs and then ensure that those needs are listened to at the level of global policy and by including their understandings at the UN. It's about taping, taking a step back as an academic. It's about not prioritising or showcasing my research. It's about ensuring that voices are taken forward. Ideally, I'd like to make myself redundant in this field and move on to another project because we have the voices of this isolated and often neglected community um, prioritised instead of my own. So it's essential that we have high quality outreach and engagement um, to support these communities uh, and to ensure that there's improved likelihood of support and receipt of um, appropriate reparations. It is essential that communities are provided with the, you know, this, these opportunities. And um, so as part of this research, um, I undertook a series of participatory community workshops with 175 members of the community to learn what they want, to learn how they would prefer to engage with policymakers, and to um, learn what they want from the Community Trust Fund, um, and to equip the local community as well um, with understanding of, of how UN policy works and how to access um, you know, the appropriate people to kind of share their thoughts and ensure that their thoughts are listened to, um, you know, to engage with NGOs, engage with the UN. Um, I developed education packs to support future community engagement with the treaty as well, um, and undertook an interview series to identify community knowledge baselines um, and assumptions about the nuclear issues that affect their land. And my work my recent work has shown that there's extremely limited understanding among the younger generation. Um, and it highlights that older people in Carissimas who've lived through nuclear weapons tests 
should not have to be the sole ambassadors of that island's dark past. Um, so something beyond oral storytelling is needed to support the community and to help them to preserve their history. Um, so my hope is that my research will give the community um, more autonomy by facilitating their voices um, and um, providing a simple way for them to develop their own knowledge and contacts across disarmament organisations. So the first thing I get do when I get off this call um, will be to email out um, a community contact database that I've helped develop um, to let them know um, about um, a new um, petition that's been developed um, that explores Article 6 and 7 in the context of the UK, for example. So it's about retaining and supporting those networks and making sure that those voices are prioritised. So the community have said that they want um, community-led and grassroots projects that allow their island to flourish um, as much as it can after the nuclear weapons tests, but they want to become resilient in the face of climate crisis in their way, in their language, in their words, um, and through the strategies that they help design and implement. Um, and they want to know more information about treaties um, and projects that are available. Um, Specifically, they said they wanted a local community member as um, to represent them on the island um, to facilitate things like environmental remediation and management, ecosystem development, landscape restoration um, and um, cultural preservation. Um, you know, and these important things. Um, so we also discussed about kind of how the two, Treaty for a Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and how um, we can support um, contributions and how we can support the community and in this sense and um, there was very much an agreement um, that um, they, were, they were hoping that the UK would you know contribute and would support them so it's been quite disappointing to learn that they you know that it hasn't. Um, my work really argues that you know decisions that are made about funding about reparations about um, all these kind of issues that have an economic, social, cultural impact must be made by the key representatives and communities, and it must include women, equality, diversion and participation by Indigenous um, groups. And that all communities affected by nuclear weapons should be eligible. So whether they're nuclear refugees, whether they've been forced to leave their land, whether they are economic migrants, um, all those who have lived and been affected by nuclear weapons testing in Carissimas deserve support. There's also this um, argument that, um, you know, we need to make sure that there isn't a quick fix as well. We need to have realistic benefits um, to communities. And, um, support with things like um, reporting and accountability measures as well and um, because a lot of the time with indigenous communities um, they're given support and then set up to fail they're not given the appropriate tools to be able to administer the support that's provided um, and that should be provided to them so um i think it's interesting because this idea of generating community understanding and um, it's been universally acknowledged as a good idea um you know by everybody from the um Kirismas, um um victims association um you know to um to ambassador Sito, who's a former president of the republic of kiribati um but i think there's still a lot more work to be done and i think that the work that i'm undertaking um is kind of providing just a small snapshot into um, the support that needs to be provided. Um, and so I wanted to mention some other research that's ongoing at the moment as well. Um, I think there's quite an important project um, happening in Australia at the moment. And um, there's a human rights lawyer, um, uh, Australian Catholic University, um, who I've been in discussion with called Patrick Kayser, um, who's fighting for justice for Kiribati, um, not through the TPNW, um, but through um, legal action against the UK. Um, so he's trying to work out how he can ensure and his team can ensure that governments are responsible for the damage and that they compensate um, the you know, victims. Um, so to end my talk, really, I think that um, through my research, uh, my recent research, it's really shown the importance of decolonizing 
um, and ensuring inclusivity um, as we look forward with the TPNW and other action to ensure reparations and justice for communities and that the best way forward for this is ensuring that there's accessibility and accountability and inclusion when it comes to global policy because if communities cannot access what they deserve at the highest level or if it's dictated to them what they will receive how will they regain their autonomy and dignity um i think it's so important um and um so hopefully with the help of civil society though um, academia the media the communities themselves and the large group of states um, the un who are now intent on pursuing change um the governments who have harmed um nuclear communities worldwide no longer have anywhere to hide so it's been a pleasure to speak to you. I hope you found my talk interesting. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Becky. That was fascinating. And it's it's just wonderful to hear everybody who's working so hard on these issues and, the, and that they're being brought into the light now. And reparations and justice could be a possibility. Um, so to wind up the talk now, David Cullen is going to connect some of these issues we've been hearing to the current new UK nuclear weapons programme. David is the main the director and the main research and report author at Nuclear Information Service. Um, so he'll be connecting nuclear colonialism to the current nuclear weapons programme. He's worked with us since 2016 and has produced several publications, including the report Extreme Circumstances about the new UK nuclear warhead and Trouble Ahead about problems in the nuclear weapons programme. David. Thanks very much, Trish. Um, and first of all, thank you to all of our other speakers. I'm really glad that we're having this event today. It's It's been an issue I've been interested in for quite some time since I discovered in the course of my research how um, for all of the uh, the P5 nuclear weapon states, for every single one of their, the development of their nuclear weapons capability, the testing of those weapons was done in areas uh, inhabited by indigenous or minority peoples. Um, I thought that was a really striking fact. Um, the later nuclear weapon states who, who often were developing with, with little or no atmospheric testing, it's a bit different, but I thought that was really interesting and significant um geographical fact um and i'm really glad that we've we have ian and becky talking here today about that legacy um central component of colonialism um, to its uh, economic and resource exploitation and the devaluing of lives of colonial subjects related to that exploitation um today's we have a somewhat different format from how we often do our our webinars at, at NIS. We've intentionally not foregrounded our expertise in this subject, but uh, as is appropriate to this subject, wanted to foreground the um, stories and perspectives of affected peoples. And I hope you found that as interesting as I have. I found it really fascinating. And thanks once again. Uh, this this part of, of the, the webinar um, is billed as me talking a bit about linking um, what we've already heard to um, current developments and developments in the UK. I think actually the speakers have done a great job of that. Um, I'm just going to offer us a, a sort of thoughts on a couple of areas that we haven't touched on so much. The first is is um, the resumption of nuclear testing, as probably as, as everyone knows. We've recently seen um, Russia revoking their ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, um, which match, brings their status back to where the United States is, that they've signed but not ratified it. Um, and also, it, we're seeing observable increased activity in the test site in the Vyaz Emilia in Russia. Um, so there are, it's quite a, a serious, credible prospect that, that Russia might uh, carry out a live nuclear test for the first time since the um, uh, the moratorium that's been observed by um, all of the um, P5 nuclear weapon states um, for a long time. Um, and if that happens, there's a, again, a very credible, realistic possibility that within the United States, from the rights of, of politics within the states, but also from some voices within the nuclear weapons program in the US, um, pressurise in the US to also carry out live nuclear testing relating to its, its weapons upgrades. Um, presumably, if that takes place, that would happen in uh, Nevada. 
underground testing is not as catastrophic for for health as as um, atmospheric testing, at least in the near term. But we, if if that took place, we would see um, some of the harms we've already heard being again visited on people in the area. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is is the sort of uh, aspect of colonialism that we haven't addressed so much uh, today, and I'll talk already, which is the exercise of military force in, in many ways one of the most central aspects of colonialism. Um, when we're talking about uh, nuclear weapon states exercising force, um, thankfully, in almost all um, cases, we're not talking about nuclear weapon, but we're talking about conventional forces. But for nuclear weapon states, the exercise of military power is underpinned by nuclear weapons. They have a theoretical recourse to the use of nuclear weapons whenever they are engaged in conflicts and the existence of nuclear weapons is, is to some extent enabling their exercise of military force. In the UK, when we talk about the UK, there's in sort of public discourse, there's this idea that the UK um, removed its, its military presence from east of Suez in the uh, 1960s. I mean, even at the time, that wasn't as clear cut as it's made out to be. We had quite a lot of uh, discussion amongst ourselves when we were planning this this event earlier this week about how to characterize the case of Diego Garcia, which is a colonial holding of the UK and now ruled not to be legally held um, by the International Court of Justice that's used as a US military base. Um, it's partly difficult to characterize because the exact status of nuclear weapons at the site is, is not wholly known, but it's certainly a place where um, US uh, nuclear powered uh, submarines and ships visits and uh, bombers that are nuclear capable, US bombers that are nuclear capable also visit. Um, so it's it's quite closely connected to projection of US force around the world, including the threat of, of the use of nuclear weapons. And it's, you know, it's directly a UK colonial holding. Uh, there are other examples. Um, and at a time when the UK and the US and Australia are Incorporating the AUKUS partnership, um, which is, is partly about being able to um, exercise conventional military force in the South China Sea, um, and also in the you know in the shadow of some of the military interventions of the UK in the Middle East. I think it's appropriate to question and critique this idea that the UK is a post-colonial state uh, in terms of its its projection of military force around the world. Uh, that's all I wanted to say, and thanks again to our speakers. I look forward to the questions. Okay, thanks, David. So, uh, yeah, we've got a couple of questions. You should all have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to put some questions in. We've got about 20 minutes left. Um, there's a couple already. So there's one there from Catherine Eschel. Can the panellists all see the questions? Yeah. Uh, so that's a question there for you, Becky. Um, I can read it. It's um, thank you for your extremely powerful presentation. Could Becky explain a little more the geography of nuclear tests and impacts in Kiramati? I'm not sure if that's how you say it. For those of us ignorant of it, where the tests were, where people were moved to, are they permanently displaced? Also in relation to epistemic just injustice, I wonder if all speakers want to reflect on why their stories of the impacts of every stage of the nuclear chain on communities are so hard to prove in terms of Western science and how nuclear states are able to continue to contest those impacts and maintain wider ignorance and silence. Thank you so much for your question, Catherine. Um, it's great. Um, and um, yeah, the geography of the British nuclear weapons tests is very interesting, I think, um, because of the kind of mass movement of um, soldiers from the UK, um, of weapons from the UK, um, and, um, and um, the kind of spatialities um, of the materials that were sourced to make the weapons as well. Um, so, um, the tests were undertaken um, just off the south coast of Carissimas in the context of the Carissimas nuclear weapons tests. Um, and um, the communities were moved from the south um, of the island um, to the north of the island to an area called Oronton. 
um, and um, they moved away from anywhere that um, was one that was wanted to use um, for testing, um, but also away from anywhere that was wanted to use for encampment and militarization. Um, so you have this internal forced migration, essentially, um, where the people of Karasamas became um, what I describe as nuclear refugees. Um, and they're refugees because they cannot return home to the space within their island um, where they previously existed, because for part of that space, um, it's what I describe as a coral desert. And I can share some photographs afterwards, but um, from my most recent trip, but there's an area the size of a football pitch um, that used to, um, according to local narratives, have um, lush greenery and um, salt bush where they used to be able to grow papaya and breadfruit um, and is now dead grey coral slightly scorched um, that was thrown up um, from the grapple nuclear weapon tests. Um, so the community are permanently displaced within their nation state um, and within their islands. Um, and um, obviously that has impacts regarding heritage, culture and history um, and community. And it also has impacts regarding the security um, and well-being of the community itself and their sense of self and sense of autonomy. Because if you're forcefully moved so someone can weaponize your island, um, as you can imagine, um, it would have a huge impact upon the dignity um, of the communities who were affected. Um, so, yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you so much. And um, I think that's um, all I want to say on that. So I'll pass on the question regarding epistemic justice, which is justice of knowledge um, to the other um, speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Ian. I want to add to the uh, why it's continuing. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, 5,000 Americans, five to 6,000 Americans are moving to Las Vegas every month. They are masking health effects. These are people who are ignorant of uh, what's going on here. They're coming from uh, Hurricane Katrina. They're coming from other hurricanes. They are uh, environmental uh, uh, catastrophes suffered in other parts of the world. People are coming here from, from everywhere. But our... Um, um, our, our numbers are so small that it's difficult to prove statistically a cause-effect relationship. And as I mentioned, uh, the United States has come into our country in secret. We didn't understand what was going on. We didn't know the the, the effects. We saw our people and our livestock uh, becoming ill, and we on our own began to investigate, but we don't have the funds. We don't have the resources. And the United States has uh, uh, done this for over uh, 75 years with a big propaganda machine telling us about uh, nuclear energy too cheap to meter never happened fusion is just around the corner it's been going on for 50 years and, and we're still not there yet but the promise and the money that is backing these types of uh, efforts 70 percent of u.s gold production comes from shoshone country they are exploiting my land and people the taxes that go to nevada Nevada gives that to every unit of local government except Indians, which is racism. It is taxation without representation. It is exploitation. It is abuse. They've destroyed our economy and kept us poor, leaving us on reservations. It is a systemic racism uh, here in the United States, and we are uh, 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 victims of that. Now, the problem with films like uh, Oppenheimer, it is appropriately just like the film Barbie. It's about an individual. It is not about humanity. It is not about all the rest of us and what has happened to all of us. And another problem is that we run the risk of not informing the youth the truth and believe, leave them thinking that that's all there is. Oppenheimer uh, is great entertainment, but I have not seen it. And what I understand, when I have seen of Oppenheimer himself talking about becoming having become evil, uh, 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 referencing Hindu scriptures, he is acknowledging he's lost his humanity. He's become uncivilized. And it's uh, 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 a slow fall into barbarism. And that's where we are today in this world, by not understanding what these weapons mean and the use of these. The Cold War ended when the Kazakhs decided not to continue to build nuclear weapons. They came to our country. We smoked the peace pipe with them. And we changed the weapons testing. We need to continue to do that. Now, the W-93 is the new U.S. warhead design. It would need to be tested. It, 
testing that would violate every Indian peace treaty on this continent. It, invi it violates other international law as well, as well as the UN Convention on Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. So that's where we're at. That's what we need to do. The W in 93 stands for Weapons Design 93. Trinity would be Weapons Design 1. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And there's uh, David, you've got a question. It wasn't a question. It was. It was coming. It was following in on an a, a additional answer. Really, um, in in terms of proving harm, part of the reason is that it's difficult, right? So, the long term harms of radiation are stochastic. They're not. It's not possible to measure a dose and be certain that some will have an ill effect. The um, the biological processes by which that happens are very complicated and can't be monitored externally. Our, our science isn't up to it. But that uncertainty is compounded by political decisions that are inflected by racism and by, you know, uh, ideas of who counts or who doesn't. So data was not ever collected of exposed persons in a um, comprehensive way. That includes both the service personnel when we're talking about some of the testing history that we've heard about, but also of the indigenous people nearby. And that was it was deliberately not collected. Um, and alongside that, you have an idea of um, what should be done in the um, question of uncertainty. If you're uncertain about the, the harms of these uh, these tests, what's the appropriate response? The appropriate response from some people in the scientific establishment is to assume no harm as opposed to assume that you know take a precautionary principle um and again there are you know questions of race and who counts around those decisions and that that perspective okay thank you thank you that's that's um yeah we need to amplify voices and we need to keep the story going over here so uh, any other um we've just got five minutes left anybody got a burning uh question answer that can be done in a minute or two. Yes, Ian. Yes, just just to talk about what uh, people in uh, Great Britain, Great Britain can do. Um, Great Britain has agreements around the world, such as the uh, uh, with the United States, at the Organization of American States. I mean, excuse me, the Op Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, these relationships with the United States and other uh, nations uh, obligate you to uh, know what your partners are doing and how they are conducting themselves in international relations and restrain acts that would violate just uh, those agreements. So I, can, I would want you to consider what agreements you have with the United States and how those agreements uh, uh, reflect upon your conduct in relation with those other nations, such as the United States. Okay, thank you. Um, Becky, one last comment from you. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to quickly mention the notion of kind of the fallacy of empirical necessity, as I describe it. So there's this argument that evidence needs to be quantified. And I can understand where this comes from. I was a physical scientist. I worked on new methods for treating soils containing plutonium. I made a mathematical and computational model for radiation protection, parts of which are used by Public Health England, right? But we cannot quantify this. We have really high quality social and political science data and public health data that evidences the harms. We do not need to say there are 50 cancer cases. There is evidence of trauma. We just need to get the right scientists out there, the right social scientists out there um, to do larger scale studies that compare across communities. I think we need to, looking forward, work with communities to facilitate this you know action of this nature um, and i think it's really important because the governments will use empiricism and empirical data um, to try and thwart um, action and actually there is a lot more um, beyond this um, within our investigative remit so thank you thank you um just a couple of quick more comments from the q a uh, anonymous attendee saying, would aligning with the climate lobby help to strengthen calls for nuclear disarmament, um, looking at, at the um, environmental damage? And uh, another one saying, would it be more appropriate to describe the UK as a colonial state rather than post-colonial? Obviously, to all of our um, panellists for speaking on, on this difficult subject. 
Um, and yeah, thanks from everyone. So just remains in the last few minutes for me to say, yeah, we've heard some very disturbing accounts of the impacts of our nuclear colonialism on communities around the world. It has been an honor to host these speakers and to hear their stories directly. Going forward, these issues need to be included in all of our nuclear disarmament efforts, and we must all find ways to amplify the voices. So uh, we're at the end, a follow up email to attendees will be sent out next week with further information, links to campaigns. And uh, it just remains for me to thank everyone, our speakers and our attendees for being here with us today. Thank you. And thank you for hosting us. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.